artificial intelligence and machine learning has a lot of you know, positive benefits, you know, enormous benefits for collectively for, for the future, for society, for the community. What I'm sort of curious about to get your thoughts on is the rapid deployment of any technology. I think it's quite evident that policy and regulation and governance sort of lags behind the rapid innovation that sort of comes with technology. So I'd love to get your thoughts on what are some of the, the risks to the rapid development and deployment of AI within the public sector? Yeah, well, I'm, give me a second to maybe get my thoughts together. Um, I think one thing, at least that uh, I've learned through my research is that a lot of the principles, so we're deploying AI in, in services that have been you know, defined over multiple decades, right? So. Uh, the state ha has, in I mean, depending on where you are, but the state may be responsible for healthcare, it may be responsible for education, um, it's responsible for some level of economic planning, it's responsible for road sort of layouts, right? So, so there are these tasks that states are already um, sort of responsible for. And then we're, and what that also means that certain norms and practices, so under what norms, what, what governance norms are these projects carried out? Uh, under uh, have already been established. Um, and I think one of the challenges is that, um, at least with when I've, when I've looked at, for example, credit, is that the, the technology has moved sort of so quickly, or um, in some ways the technology seems so new that we haven't held on to like these existing standards, we haven't held on to these existing norms, and contrasted whether these technologies like fit those or not, right? So. So we've actually been willing to abandon some of these practices and some of these norms that have, and even like in some ways, it, these could be regulatory and legal structures, um, possibly because either we don't understand the technology well enough or the promise seems very sort of uh, dizzying. And so we're so attracted by it and we're like, no, uh, you know, we need to push forward with this. Uh, but I think uh, there can be a balance in that uh, when we are discussing some of these technologies, and, and I do recognize that, you know, there's always this anxiety where some countries, you know, countries feel like if they don't get to something fast enough, they're going to be left behind by other countries. And so I think we're sort of back in like um, a little more of a competitive world. Um, and, and that means that there are a lot of motivations why countries push for some of these projects. But I do think that uh, we've seen a lot of that enthusiasm. We've seen that in, in India for sure. Um, and I think it's, it's sort of um, important to hold on to these standards because like your practices and your norms have to come first because those have been developed, um, keeping in mind over multiple, multiple years, right? And multiple decades, keeping in mind like best interest of the citizens um, and also perfected by mistakes that have been made in the past. And so keep those in mind um, and then see how your technology actually got, uh, sort of uh, fits with that. I think if um, th I think that that can be a fairly good way of developing some of these uh, some of these technologies. So I think with public sector, um, the for me one of the biggest issues I think is you know if you're in the private sector, for example, Facebook uses AI, you get to choose if you can you if you want to choose that service, and same I don't know if you shop at uh, ASOS uh, I don't know if it's um, widely used in India, but you know, if that uses AI to recommend you shoes, that's okay. But I think in a public sector, which will affect millions and without them maybe having a choice if AI is used to make that decision, I think that's where we need to be so much more careful. Um, and I think really good examples in Europe for this is, for example, um, is in uh, the Netherlands, for example, just because you had a dual citizenship meant that you couldn't get any child benefits. Um, and that was an AI decision. Or again, for the UK, there were grades decided for students based on an, an algorithm. And it's just like, for the public sector, is that should we really rush it when it's got such massive impact on such a massive scale? I think in, in the way we frame the discussion about technology policy uh, and, you know, this catch up uh, when uh, technology advances much further ahead and we don't know what to how to regulate it. Uh, it's it's framed quite nicely by uh, this STS scholar, David Collingridge, where he talks about the Collingridge dilemma, which is when you when you have a new technology emerge or being used, we don't necessarily 
really understand the full scale of its impact on society. So, uh, and then when policymakers or anyone who's supposed to decide is uh, responding to the technology, they are not fully aware. They don't have enough information. We, we know about social media algorithms and uh, this language around echo chambers and uh, filter bubbles, it started to emerge much later. And we, we fully appreciated kind of the impact that it has on democracy, rule of law, our uh, freedom of expression, privacy, and so on uh, around 2016 when we started seeing uh, election interference uh, in the US, even though it was happening before in other countries like in uh, Myanmar, the Rohingyas uh, were targeted and so on. So we, we started to only later understand the implications of technology. So in this kind of situation, when we don't in the beginning know its potential impact, on society, how do we decide? Uh, that's one question. And when you don't know, if you don't do anything, the technology can get so deeply entrenched in society and systems, socio-technical systems, that it becomes a bit hard to roll it back. So, uh, so some proposals that uh, David Collingridge made uh, were around one, I think it's a bit in line with what some of the speakers before said about constantly monitoring uh, have that built in. And just the way we are seeing some of the platforms not giving access to data that they have to researchers, it's just kind of antithetical to this approach of improving things uh, because we know there is impact. So we need to constantly monitor. Or at the stage when you are kind of developing some kind of rules or regulation in the beginning, do it in a way that the cost of remedying is low and they can be easy to roll back. So it kind of provides us with a little bit of a guiding framework. I know once we go into the tricky matter on what this uh, remedy could be and what could be the low cost, it becomes messy, but it's a bit of a framework to think about how we think about regulating technology when we it's still emerging. And a few years down the line, we'll move from AI, we'll talk about quantum computing, and we'll have the same questions, same discussions. When we're talking about using AI and sort of having any public discussion and how society learns, and I'm just reminded, so in, obviously in Netherlands, we saw the Siri judgment uh, about using you know, AI for welfare systems. And in India, it's not yet been used, but if you saw how the Aadhaar, which is the biometric system, was rolled out, although that was not AI-based, and I was involved in the challenge to that, and the argument was, oh, you know, it's really new, and we learn as the system comes, and we'll solve for exclusions, except it had been 10 years, and you still get to say, like, oh, this is new technology, and we're learning. And the impact of that exclusion really falls disproportionately on marginalized populations. We also saw this again in India when we were talking about the contact tracing app, which again sort of you know, had certain false positive, false negative issues. And, you know, the point that Pratik made, like Yuval Noah Harari talks about this, right? When you build in service, like pandemics are great when you talk about the life cycle of a pandemic for the government to increase its life cycle of power and to normalize surveillance mechanisms. And I fear that because we're not really having those discussions in AI here, we are kind of, you know, potentially going into a stage where it's become, where we are suddenly going to see AI being used. So in India, you have conversations about the AI being used for judicial decision-making and in the judiciary. Right, or you have ideas about so now the intermediary rules say that as you know, all these intermediaries shall endeavor to deploy AI tools to proactively identify, you know, certain unlawful content and CSAM content, etc. And so, you know, what does what does all this mean in practice? I'm just a bit concerned that in India the discussions are still very much at like these very elite levels, right? As somebody was pointing out, it's not really filtered into the mass to the masses, and it's not become a public conversation. And so that's what makes it even more de dangerous about saying, oh my God, AI is going to solve all problems without necessarily understanding how much of it works. Yeah, thank you. And I, I think you, you 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 touched on something that was really fascinating. It's like government's role and how what you know how how do they um, see a role for themselves in obviously regulating um, this this space? Um, Dr. Dua, if I can bring you in here on this one, I think AI tools, you know, we, we, they're not created maliciously; they're not intended to be, you know. Uh, um, dysfunctional or flawed in development, but obviously we do need to take precautions and employ laws and policies to, to make sure that we mitigate against some of the we have spoken about. However, the, the common you know criticism is that you know regulation sort of stymies and stifles innovation, growth, and development. Um, so I'd love to get your thoughts on I guess balancing that you know the capacity of a national priority and um, figuring out whether 
should a government you know dive in and regulate an industry um or if they keep their hands off it let innovation and growth sort of lead that and then come in afterwards yeah thank you for this question very important one as well um yeah, I think it's it's a very delicate balance, and we know that different you know regions of the world are going in different direction. Like uh, while the European kind of uh, we like to regulate a lot <laughs> and uh, trying to kind of lead the way in that sense, um, in bringing more you know like ethical perspectives and uh, and like setting the ground kind of uh, other regions like um, notably. The U.S. and uh, perhaps also China, uh, there is more like um, you know on the innovation side, uh, more strongly thinking that the regulation will um, you know hinder the innovation. In that sense, um, I think so. I think that the balance between the two is very important, and and I think that. Uh, Stakeholders have been struggling this like since 2016, approximately, when the whole kind of discussion about it. So we came to the point knowing that, okay, we have to regulate AI because it's kind of getting out of hands and uh, and uh, the genie is getting out of the bottle and we it, 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 we should do that before it's too late. But we don't want something that is too restricting because otherwise, yeah, we, we won't have the great um, technology that we are all using on a daily basis. So the decision was to regulate through principles, was to just have a, a guidelines, you know, and like all those kind of principles started to pop up. Um, by everyone, by private sector, by civil society organizations, national countries, they started to have their own national strategies. And um, that was like the way to regulate kind of, but not really regulate. It is true that what was missing from those conversation is like that the conversation were kind of like um, very kind of centered in the Western world. And what was missing was the, um, you know, the broader perspective of the global South. Um, and I think this is why basically, so in UNESCO, when we started to think about this uh, recommendation, like the uh, the recommendation on the ethics of AI, which um, hopefully will be finalized and approved uh, very soon in November, uh, the idea was to have a UN, really UN tool uh, for governing this and something that would exactly, you know, bridge the gap and bring the perspective of the low and middle income countries, of the small develop, uh, small islands, uh, developing states, and uh, the, the broader perspective. And then when we kind of started to work on elaborating this document, um, it's true, this issue of the national capacity um, exactly like came out as well, because um, it's one thing to implement AI, and to develop AI and different countries have different capacity of doing that. So in order to really also like move the discussion a bit more from the abstractive and the principles into, into the practice, uh, what we decided to do is to um, anchor in the recommendation a tool that we are also developing, um, uh, but will kind of like more, you know, kick in after the adoption of the recommendation which is like a readiness methodology tool, which is exactly um, aimed to deal with the national capacities because it will basically assess the capability of different countries to implement ethical AI. And it will examine different dimensions of what does it mean, like the capacity of the country to implement AI, a, a regular dimension, meaning whether the country has some laws like data protection laws and national strategy, strategies for AI and other laws that that you know prepare the ground for this adoption of course ethical dimensions and also like technical dimensions and social dimensions like how people mm. are even obviously there are a broad spectrum I mean there's a huge number of you know like values that need to be adopted um, when thinking about AI and you know fairness accountability transparency environmental sustainability you know that that list um, can go on in most ethical AI frameworks. Um, I think, uh, Rohan, I might bring you in on, onto this question. Um, you know, I think obviously it, it's 
as from your based on your background i think you know trying to you know have these values embedded within the system can lead to operational difficulties like you know it's it's a difficult thing to sort of you know put into practice you know, and just say that that's what i want is it what i'm going to get um so i guess i'd love to get your thoughts on what extent to ethical guidelines and frameworks for ai um you know, do they do, do they do justice for you know abstract values like equality and transparency, given their operational challenges? Yeah, uh, no, thanks, Raj, for the question. And and um, uh, I, I think they don't, uh, right? I, I think that's the answer. And um, most often, I think there's no there, there's no dearth of frameworks like you mentioned, right? But uh, the challenge is how to enforce them and. Often, I think if if the policymakers develop ethical guidelines in a vacuum, it will fail. It, they won't be able to enforce it. But I think there's no um, magic wand to kind of solve this. I, I think the the responsibility lies both ways. And the reality of today's world um, is that regulators want to consult innovators, and many innovators want to work together with regulators. But in most cases, the the, uh, a collaborative engagement kind of falls through because um, you know there's lack of alignment on on the goals and a deep understanding of the AI production life cycle on the end of policymakers. Uh, but that said, I think let me share some thoughts on uh, what are some of the more practical build steps uh, that that uh, both innovators as well as uh, policymakers can take uh, without stimming the innovation uh, that that you know, we just discussed. So I think one is there's some responsibility with citizens as well. They you know they need to give up the false uh, binary choice uh, that in order to use some of these technologies, we need to relinquish our um, um, you know fundamental rights and, and freedoms uh, to the surveillance state, or kind of you know, or, or the opposite, which is that we we must protect our privacy and individual liberties at the cost of uh, tech for good. Um, again, I won't go into how this can be solved and what are the frameworks. I think there's enough out there, but this, this is just a mindset shift that. Uh, needs to happen, and again, uh, you know, uh, Vrinda uh, touched upon. I, I think contact tracing is a classic uh, case study uh, for this. Uh, for Paul, on the policymakers side, I think they need to. One of the things I strongly feel about is how. Wh what are some of the things they can do? And I, I think there's not enough done to create an enabling environment for responsible data sharing. So you know, there's often um, you know a lot spoken about accessible, high quality, and well archived data. Um, and, and, and innovators are often forced to kind of put uh, timely and transparent pre-publication um, and, and sharing of data. But policymakers need to realize that the, there are certain systemic barriers that prevent them from doing so. For example, I mean, take the COVID example. I think in that, the, the fears of outbreak-related uh, reputation uh, damage, uh, trade restrictions, social stigma, financial markets, a lot of these kind of uh, forced policymakers and, and you know, policymakers to clamp down on the information dis uh, dispersion the other uh, barrier is the global inequality between countries. So you have the low, low middle and uh, income countries. And then, you know, if what happens if they put in immense amount of resources in, in developing some of these data sets and then openly share them only to have the wealthier countries, um, uh, you know, use them and uh, the poor countries being excluded from the benefits uh, if those don't accrue to them. Um, or, you know, let's say vaccine is a great example of, of that. So I, I think a lot of these needs to then go, go back to how can bilateral relationships between countries uh, be, be designed to, to kind of uh, include uh, the data sharing. The other is I think for uh, policymakers, often you know, ethical, two ethical values might come into tension with each other. Again, I, I think digital contract tracing is a great example. And so they need to, policymakers need to take the time to build uh, inclusive and well-informed consensus. Again, the Aadhaar example that was mentioned, uh, I, I think this is now being uh, realized and being solved a bit. For example, I think ND, the National Digital uh, Health uh, Blueprint um, that, that the government is presently working on, they've started inviting uh, for more open discussions and feedback and uh, sharing uh, early copies. I'll probably just mention two more points on the innovator side of stuff. So one is I think innovators need to get out of this, uh, you know, uh, break things first and then think about it of uh, mindset. So they, they need to realize that there's no prior prescription or moral formula to kind of, uh, you know, determine decisions in advance. So what they need to do is set up some of these procedural mechanisms so that there can be respectful dialogue um, and, and like a common language uh, so that different positions can be heard and uh, considered. Um, uh, you know, that's, I think one, the other is, they also need to cultivate some public trust. 
uh, through end-to-end -end, um, uh, transparency, end-to-end -end, um, uh, you know, accountability, and uh, you know, pr really prioritize some of the interpretability and explainability issues. Um, often, again, I, I think a lot of these uh, are dealt with, but in a very reactive way. So if it, they can do this more design time than runtime. Um, that, that I think is uh, something uh, to be thought about. Thank you.